Brigadier General David Sarnoff, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Radio Corporation of America, during the Winter Convention of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Now we will hear from General David Sarnoff. During the past 50 years, we have learned that electricity, once looked upon as unrelated to the arts, is really a close kin. In radio broadcasting and television, in the modern phonograph, and in sound movies, music and literature have been electrified and electronized visually as well as audibly. The scientists and engineers in RCA laboratories have been experimenting for some time in an effort to broaden the creative scope of composers and musicians by enabling them to take advantage of scientific developments that can be applied to music. As you know, the physical properties of sound are frequency, intensity, waveform, and time. And the psychological characteristics of sound which depend upon the physical properties are pitch, loudness, timbre, and time. Every sound in nature may be described in terms of these attributes of sound or tone. Sound waves, of course, comprise the medium of transmission from the musician or musical instrument to the listeners. And a tone is a sound wave capable of exciting an auditory sensation having pitch. Now the operation of the RCA electronic music synthesizer is based upon the breakdown of a tone into its characteristics such as frequency, intensity, growth, duration, decay, portamento, timbre, and vibrato. For an electronic instrument to handle with all fidelity all of these characteristics of tone has presented a great challenge to our research men. But as you will observe today in our demonstration of this music synthesizer, our scientists and engineers have succeeded in developing an electronic system that even in its present stage of development achieves extraordinary results. We believe that further advances will bring this new system to a stage of practical usefulness in the world of music. The research and development work on this project is under the direction of Dr. Harry F. Olson, Director of the Acoustical and Electromechanical Research Laboratory of the RCA at Princeton, New Jersey. Dr. Olson is recognized throughout the world as an outstanding authority in the field of acoustics. And his description of the music synthesizer system is the next to my remarks. I would like to quote just one of his statements. Dr. Olson said, we have been able to create an electronic system capable of generating any tone produced by the human voice or any musical instrument as well as any musical tone which is beyond the capabilities of a voice or conventional instrument. The RCA electronic music synthesizer is a means for producing electronically an infinity of new musical complexes employing the sound of human voices and conventional instruments or tones that may never before have been heard either in solo performance or blended in any desired orchestral arrangement. The synthesizer system permits us to perform electronically the translation of the composer's score into sound and to create any sounds that may have musical significance. And that is the end of Dr. Olson's quotation. This new system of making music, it seems to me, should encourage musical composers to write new compositions that can take advantage of the wider scope and superior characteristics offered them by electronics 
for the expression of their genius. In this new role, electronics performs in marked contrast to the musician whose playing is limited to the use of ten fingers, sometimes also the two feet, or as in the case of wind instruments, the lips. This electronic instrument also offers new opportunities for production of phonograph records since it can produce any kind of sound that can be imagined. Further, old recordings can be rejuvenated into new phonograph records free from distortion and from noise. And it is not necessary that a composer be able to play a musical instrument for whatever musical effects he wants to create, he can achieve by the use of the synthesizer. But the vital factors of correct interpretation of the music written by the composer, that is, the heart, the soul, and the mood of the composition, continue to be the task and function of the human being who synthesizes the music from the score. That person must be a good musician. As Dr. Olson has said, in the hands of a great musician, the electronic synthesizer can create great music. When I first heard this machine, many of the musical notes sounded so new and strange to me that I wondered whether Maestro Toscanini, Yasha Heifetz, or Richard Rogers would be needed to produce music with this new system. But the research men tell me that while the machine does not turn engineers into composers, conductors, or instrumentalists, it does enable them to become interpreters of music. And you will be given evidence of that a little later when you will hear the interpretation of music as made by an engineer. For example, they can take the musical score of a great composer, key it through the synthesizer, and obtain results that would be achieved by musicians playing their conventional instruments. And the men who operate the synthesizer need not know how to play any musical instrument. They can simulate instrumental artists by merely pressing typewriter-like keys that actuate electron tubes and transistors. And at this point, I would like to demonstrate the results achieved on conventional magnetic tape records by engineers at our Princeton laboratories who are not musicians. They employed no instrumentalists and used no musical instruments in any of the music you will now hear. Recently, I invited Alfred Wallenstein, conductor and music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra, a guest conductor of the NBC Symphony Orchestra, and former solo cellist with the New York Philharmonic and Chicago Symphony Orchestras, to visit our Princeton laboratories and witness demonstrations of this system. I asked him to discuss its functions with the inventors and to give me the benefit of his professional judgment. He graciously accepted my invitation and came to Princeton. He spent several days in discussing this development with our scientists and engineers and in hearing and seeing the electronic music synthesizer perform. Mr. Wallenstein's full report is annexed to my remarks, and I quote only a few of his statements. He said, Indeed, the entire world of sound can be tapped for the creation of yet unheard musical forms. There is no question that if perfected and made thoroughly responsive, the electronic music synthesizer can become a veritable fountain of inspiration and new ideas, not only because endless new timbres can be invented, but also because realization of any pattern, no matter how rhythmically, melodically, or harmonically complex and extensive, becomes possible through the series of routine manipulations. And it can synthesize voices from the past, such as Caruso's great voice, creating the accurate timbre and then reconstructing 
an aria from some opera. And Mr. Wallenstein concluded, in its present state, the electronic system of synthesized music is not at a point where it can replace or personalize live artists or orchestras. However, the ideas expressed for further development of this system, when realized, should make it possible not only to expand the boundaries of music, but also to achieve musical results that can now be achieved only through human hands and voices and only with existing musical instruments. And at this point, demonstrate the results achieved on conventional magnetic tape records by engineers at our Princeton laboratories who are not musicians. They employed no instrumentalists and used no musical instruments in any of the music you will now hear. Now you may wonder what philosophy prompts me to reveal these new developments publicly while they are still in the experimental stage. Why do we not wait until they have been completed as commercial products? My answer is simple. Competition can be as stimulating in research as in manufacturing and merchandising. As members of a profession deeply concerned with scientific research and pioneering development, you are well aware that the number of people willing to risk their money in research and pioneering is very small compared with those who are ready to risk their capital in established enterprises operating profitably. In television and in other instances, that is where the information is not classified, and does not involve our national security. RCA has continually made progress reports and released information that enabled others not only to catch up, but at times even to move ahead of us. We welcome competition. It spurs our own activities and increases the possibilities for earlier achievement of desired results. For instance, our faith and persistence in pioneering television, first black and white and then color, and our encouragement to others to get into the field, led to its present state of development, which otherwise the American public might not have enjoyed for another 10 years. Whether we succeed in completing an invention before others whom we stimulate to work along, along similar lines is not as important as it is to bring a new product or a new service into existence and use. In helping industry to grow and prosper, we believe that we contribute to the public benefit and in the long run, our own as well. If an organization is to progress, it must not stand in fear of obsolescence or competition. Electronics, in the race to achieve new triumphs, is run on the big track of time on which there is room for all who would compete. There is no finish line. Now, having been introduced to these several new developments that closely relate science to the arts, it must occur to you that the days here when the engineer and the artist should join forces and seek to understand the terminology and the problems of each other in order to advance together. If you will form an intellectual camaraderie and arrive at a common language with your colleagues in the arts, so that they can learn how to make full use of science and technology, you will see the fruits of your genius bloom in the vineyards of the cultural arts. The liberal arts should not shrug off advances in science and technology as too technical to understand, and engineers at their end should not regard music and the arts as outside their natural domain. For more than a quarter of a century, 
The entertainment arts have felt the magic touch of electronics, and as a result, music, drama, motion pictures, the phonograph, and even journalism have taken on new dimensions. New interest has been created in them, and their audiences have multiplied from thousands to millions. The music synthesizer aptly illustrates how important it has become for the electronics engineer and the musician to understand the achievements and the objectives of each other. The same is true for all men and women in the physical sciences in their relationships to those who are working in the humane sciences. Medical men must also become better acquainted with the scientists and engineers in many phases of atomics and electronics so that the isotopes, color television, electron microscopy, and similar developments can be applied effectively and quickly for the welfare of mankind and the extension of life's span. For the good of America and the world in general, the arts and sciences are challenged to work together and to bring their respective talents and skills into focus. In effect, men of science and the arts must play on the same team and understand each other's signals so that they can score together. And at this point, I would like to demonstrate the results achieved on conventional magnetic tape records by engineers at our Princeton laboratories who are not musicians. They employed no instrumentalists and used no musical instruments in any of the music you will now hear. <laughs> 